beginning our first class for our first uh, semester of this go-round of the Bible School. <clears throat> uh, we will also, Deb will give more information on Sunday, but uh, we will begin on Wednesdays also um, to have uh, cross principles and another subject. And uh, that'll start at the normal time, I guess, 7 o'clock. Well, she'll explain all that later. Anyway, so anyone here, you're welcome to come to any of the classes that you want, except for two people. You're supposed to be there. <laughs> Amen. All right. Well, let's officially begin if you hadn't started the... All right. Amen. Well, let's turn to Genesis chapter 11. <clears throat> We are <clears throat> we're going to be studying um, basically the story of Abraham, which involves a lot of other people. <clears throat> For sure, Isaac, his son, Ishmael, his son. Um, and we're going to be studying them in light of the firstborn. Now, for those of you who haven't been here, I will make many references back to <clears throat> the story of the prodigal son and also to Cain and Abel. Um, because uh, they, they have great bearing upon this story uh, as we study Abraham. <clears throat> and. Um, and for those of you who were in those times together, those classes, those sharings, um, this, uh, this uh, beginning of sharing on Abraham, this is going to bring us forth more into an understanding of the firstborn. Um, and one of the main things that it's going to show us, even though it has a wonderful ending, it's going to show us how many times we miss the firstborn. We miss him when it, we, should have, we should have known who God's firstborn was. Um, we miss him. And Abraham, the father of faith, did it. <clears throat> he did it over and over and over again. And I use a little phrase a lot, and y'all, some of you are familiar with it. Can you spot the firstborn? Can you spot him in the scriptures? Can you spot him in one another? Can you, do you see by the father's eyes in relationship to the firstborn son? Which of course we're talking about Jesus. And um, to see him is not <clears throat> some sort of a vision or some sort of a, an experience, but to see him first is to see him in the scriptures, to know Christ. Jesus said, search the scriptures, for they are they which testify of me. And when he said that, he, there were no New Testament scriptures at that time. There was only the Old Testament. And he said, search the scriptures. And when he shared on the road to Emmaus, he shared all the things that pertain to him, beginning with Moses, which is Genesis all the way through <clears throat> and showed the, that he was written into that. It wasn't the story just of a, the history of Israel, but it was meant to be the revealing of the Son. And so here in Genesis chapter 11, we began, and we're going to see, we're going to see a lot of information at first because we're going to build we're going to we're going to have to build and the story builds and the story doesn't just start off with a bang the story has to lay some groundwork and the scriptures have to lay groundwork in our heart and in our soul and we have to approach the scriptures not as <clears throat> um, like the way you would read uh, the life of uh, you know Abraham Lincoln or something, and you, you approach the reading about Abraham here in the Bible the same way, <clears throat> you have to approach with your heart saying, Lord, I want to know you. I want to see you. I want you. I don't, but 
to get there, there, you have to lay the groundwork of the scriptures. And we have to stay with the scriptures. Um, because why? Because the scriptures declare, and Jesus declared, when he talked about the Holy Spirit, um, even though it's all written in the New Testament and is clear about gifts of the Spirit and all that sort of stuff, when Jesus talked about the Holy Spirit, he's not talking about somebody that's going to come that's going to be exciting to us. He's talking about somebody who has been with him throughout all eternity past. You understand what I'm saying? He, un he knows the Holy Spirit. It's... They are the Trinity. They are three and they are in one. And that oneness is what we were brought into. And we need to quit trying to know him as just students or just Christians. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to know him as he is and as he is eternally so that that life of Christ can be made manifest through us to the world. And they would see not, not that we're good Christians, but they would see Jesus. And so, but to do that, we have to begin with <clears throat> scriptures that seem um, here in Genesis that seem unimportant, that seem like um, more genealogy type stuff, you know, um, instead of God can speak to us here and will speak to us and we'll use this if we gather this in if we gather this in in spirit and in our heart we gather this in and we say lord this looks like it doesn't have a lot of information and we hold it before the lord when the time comes he will show why he put this in here he put this in here and if he put it there i want it and I want to know why he did it, and I want to be with him in his heart. So, <clears throat> let's begin in verse, um, well, we might as well confuse you and start with verse 24, and I'll tell you why it confuse you here in a minute. And Nahor lived nine and twenty years and begat Terah. And Nahor lived after he begat Terah a hundred and nineteen years and begat sons and daughters, and Terah lived 70 years and begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. So already we're, we're confused because Terah is the father of Abraham, okay? And his father's name was Nahor. But he also named one of his sons Nahor. And you'll see that also Haran's name gets used over and over in different ways also because at that time, it's, this is the early part of the... the spreading of humanity and people having kids and stuff and i assume that they weren't real creative with their names i'm joking i'm just saying <laughs> but uh, you know so he goes what can i name you uh nahor because that's <clears throat> all right so um verse 26 and terah lived 70 years and begat abraham nahor and haran Verse 27, now these are the generations of Terah. This, again, is the father of Abraham. Terah begat Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity, in the Ur of the Chaldees. And most of you know this, but the Ur of Chaldees was an early name for the area known as Babylon. Um, and so, so they were born there. And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. <clears throat> um, the name of Abraham's wife was, and I honestly, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce this exactly, so I'm just going to call her Sarah because that's what we know her as. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abraham's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. <clears throat> All right, so uh, in verse... Uh, 
26 through 28, um, we start finding out about the family. And uh, you, if you're going to know who the firstborn is, not just the firstborn in birth order, but you're going to know God's firstborn, then you're going to know Jesus. And you're going to find him by knowing the father's heart because when it comes to a son, nobody knows the son better than the father. Okay, so this means that we have to know the father's heart concerning his son. Uh, religion has a view of the son and it's, it's a good view. It's not necessarily bad. I mean, we're all saved. We're all born again. We're all, you know, going to heaven, this and that. But the father knew the son before there was heaven and hell and the devil and sin and everything else. And the son was everything to the father then. So what does that say? It says in, in a very real way, we know Jesus in a temporal way based on our needs, based on our needs. Okay. Not bad, but certainly not knowing him the way we should know him. <clears throat> so that means that, that again, um, and as we go along, sometimes things are said, and in our heart, at that very moment, we should say, Father, I want to know you, and I want, you, I want to know the Son the way you know him before there was all of this stuff. Open my eyes and open my heart. You see what I'm saying? We, these, we should be tender and open and moving with the Spirit as we move forward through these things. So um, just information, but it, it will be pertinent later on. <clears throat> Tara had three sons. Abram, which eventually, as most of you know, is the same as Abraham. He gets his name changed later on, and that, that's pertinent also. Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. So Abraham is the firstborn, <clears throat> but he's the firstborn in birth order. So never assume that it's Christ. You know what? I can tell you absolutely you will be deceived if you go by birth order, even with Abraham if you're not careful. You and I need to get our information from the Holy Spirit, not just from me and not just from the Bible without the Holy Spirit breathing on it. That's, that's important. That's incredibly important. Okay, so, you know, I can, I can do my best to stand up here and impart and, and release uh, what I can of the Lord, um, but I'm fallible. So we need, I, if I put myself in the same category, we need the Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. All right, so uh, Abraham was the firstborn, or Abram at this point. Haran was the youngest, <clears throat> um, so uh, it says that uh, Terah's youngest son gave him a grandson named Lot, okay, and then Haran, Haran died in the Ur of Chaldees, and apparently, because it doesn't say much about Nahor, he stayed back. He didn't leave with the rest of the family, and then we hear basically nothing of him anymore. He stepped out of the eternal. He stepped out of the book. He stepped out of the father's hand of writing the story because for whatever reason, he saw something more important in Babylon for his life than the call of God. Um, so the marriages are, are described, which I read um, in verse 29 and 29. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. All right. Uh, it's interesting that it throws that in right there, right from the beginning. Right from the very beginning, if Abraham is the firstborn, his firstborn is in line, in the line to, to carry the inheritance and the oversight of the family, which, of course, in a very, I mean, we're, we're referring to Christ in this, but there are facts that we have to learn as we go along. Uh, but Abraham can't, through his wife, can't bring forth a firstborn. And it throws that in right at the 
right at the very beginning, okay? So, um, uh, I wrote down something here just to see if anybody picked, how much you picked up, and I'm, I'm not expecting a whole lot here. Uh, tell me something about Haran without looking. Just anything, somebody, Deb? What else? His son is Lot. Pardon? His son. His son is Lot. I thought you said Sir Lancelot. <laughs> okay, good. Anybody else? Birth order, anybody? Second. Second, yes, good. Amen. Um, yes, Deb. Well, that's what it says in the scriptures, yeah. which is he, he died in Babylon. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, had a couple of kids. What about, you got one. Yes? Milka. Didn't you ever hear seven sons did Milka bear? <laughs> which has absolutely nothing to do with the Bible. <laughs> uh, okay, so... Um, so Nahor married one of Haran's children. It was Milka. Okay. Uh, and he had another daughter, and her name is Iska. It says that. That's what we've been reading. Um, and then probably one of the things that will crop up a lot, get it, <laughs> is, is uh, the final thing about Haran, tell me something about Haran, is that the place where Terah brings his family and stops and settles, he names it Haran. Okay? Well, it's not really back then, again, you know. Yes. That's where Rebecca comes from. Yeah, yes. Big stuff here. You can, it, you know, some of you know the scriptures well enough that you're going, oh my God, this is. There's a real flow into all of this. <clears throat> all right. Um, so, <clears throat> in Genesis um, 11, 31, 32, some very important things here. It says. Uh, and Terah took, notice that Terah took Abram, his son. It was not Ab Abram who went on his own initiative. Okay. All right, let's talk about who made the journey then. <clears throat> Verse 31, and Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, uh, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth unto them from the Ur of Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. They came unto Haran and dwelt there. So Terah took his eldest son, Abram, Lot, who was Terah's grandson, by who? Haran. And they brought Sarah, Abram's wife, and... Um, Nahor and his middle son stayed in the Ur of Chaldees. Where were they headed? And Terah took Abram his son and Lot the son of Haran his son's son Sarah to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. This is verse 31 and 32. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there and the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. So they got to a place just before they got to the land. They named it after Lot's father. Uh, and the journey stopped. The journey stopped. Okay? All right, well, you know, 
the the word this the wording here says that the Lord said go to the land of Canaan and it doesn't say that Haran the place they named Haran was beautiful or special or particularly anything but it does say that they stopped and they stayed there for a long time and as you know the story because some of you quoted that's where Rebecca came from many years later they camped and I'll just tell you right now it's easy to camp on some area some truth and not keep going not keep pursuing not say Lord I want to enter into all that you've got and it's even worse to not even enter the land and start camping. Um, you know, Abraham, this, one of the big de uh, defining things about Abraham is he dwelt in tents. God told him to possess the land. So those tents were causing him to be able to go anywhere he wanted to, anytime he wanted to. And this is one of the things that I personally have tried, tried to stress to you guys is that, you know, put yourself in a position like you're living in a tent where God can tell you to go anywhere at any time. Put yourself in a position to be able to obey the voice of the Lord if he says, go on this mission trip or, or literally go over here, move over here and, and be a blessing to these people or whatever. That in your heart, you're like Abram and, and you are, are um, uh, available to the Lord. You're available to the Lord. And it's a simple little thing. You can just read in, in the stories. You read there. Of, and, you know, Abraham moved and went over here. And, and, you know, in Hebrews it says, and he dwelt in tents and all this. And go, <clears throat> okay, he dwelt in tents. But can there be a spiritual meaning to these things? Can the Spirit of God speak to our hearts and say, don't just read Abram's story. Let the Spirit of God write your own story. Let it become your story. Let it be worked in you. Find reality, but don't just put it in your head. Put it as your life, put it in you. Let the Spirit of God bring forth Christ and fit it into you and move you the way he wants to instead of religiously because you know some Bible information. We want the Lord. And we want to be with the Lord at any time when he, when he calls us. And, and I know that's not always a perfect situation, that you can always do that. <clears throat> but I know that if we think about it, if we're, if we're trying to order our life as much as we can by it, then we will be available more than we would have had we never thought of that. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's important. And it's important to the Father because if the Father... The Father is not just speaking to us, giving us instructions. He is dealing with us to be able to release his son in these ways. I'm calling my son out of Egypt. I'm calling my son to go. It's, it is those things, and those things are meant to touch our heart and not just be Bible facts. Because I, you know... I think Bible facts will make you a Pharisee if you're not careful. Seriously. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I want to know the Lord. I want my heart to be open. I want to seek him. I want to be with him. I want my life. You know, people say, I want my life to count. I don't want my life to count. I want Jesus' life to count. And he lives in me. And then all glory goes to him. You know, well, Randy, you did this or you did that. No, I didn't. <laughs> you know, I'm not that smart. I'm not that good. It's the Lord, and so to him be all the glory. So you can see that I'm saying that these really are heart issues first. They are not Bible school issues. They are not church issues. They're not religion-centered. They are centered on the heart of the Father toward His Son, and they are centered on the heart of the Son and the, and the openness of the Holy Spirit. I mean, because the Holy Spirit is, is designated by Jesus' baptism as a dove that's got wings. Then why do we hold him down inside of us and never let him fly, never let him take us where 
places that we couldn't see where he can see because he can fly above that and because he knows where to go. But we, we, we just, you know, somebody taught us that the Holy Spirit will give us gifts or bless us during the church service and, you know, when I'm worshiping or whatever. Well, that's fine. I'm not against that. But let's not hold him to that. What a terrible thing to do that to him, to clip his wings. Terrible. All right, so Terah lived to 205 years and died in Haran. That, that will not be on a test. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just going to read some of my notes. I think we've kind of got the scriptures down in a certain sense. I wrote, notice that the vast majority of the information involves information as to who could qualify as the firstborn and who could not. That's what's, that's the, we, th we call it a lineage, <laughs> but it's actually laying forth who can qualify as the firstborn and who cannot. Now, it doesn't matter about who can qualify and who cannot. What matters is who the father says the firstborn is. That's what matters. But it helps in our scripture searching maybe to be able to spot the firstborn Jesus a little easier in scriptures and in one another or in someone that we're, we're treating badly when they might be the firstborn. And, I, and, you know, just so you know, every firstborn that represents Christ in the scriptures really goes through a, a bad phase where they look bad. I mean, the, see, the goal isn't even to look good. I mean, we've in the past talked about <clears throat> Mordecai in the book of Esther and how everyone has praised and lifted him up, and yet we didn't spot that this was, you know, uh, this is not good. That's all I can say, not good, not God. And, um, you know, the thought came to me, it's, you know, because you got Haman in that story. You know, remember the story? You know, you got Haman in there and you go, you know, I mean, the phrase came to me, it's easy to discern bad and evil, but it's not easy to discern good. And they're both off the same tree. Don't eat of that tree, good and evil. We can't seem to discern good as off of that tree. We will even call it God when it's not God, when it's Jesus, when it's, you know, and we do it on a regular basis. And see, here's the, here's part of the beauty that I love about the story of Abraham and Isaac and the, the whole flow of this story is, <clears throat> again, Abraham messes up again and again, but it teaches us that we're, we're just as faulty as he is, or he's just as faulty as us, and that our eyes will grab the first thing because all of his choices, because he made a bunch along the way, are based on sense realm knowledge and not the, not the spirit giving us the Father's heart. So why don't we just do that right now? Let's pray. Father, we just ask you to help us to see, to know, to to, Father, we are so quick to be able to judge evil uh, in, in Haman, but we can't discern what's wrong in Mordecai, Lord. Our, our judgments are wrong, and our ways of seeing and thinking are wrong. And we ask you, we ask you, we ask you in Jesus' name to open up your heart and the horizons of your view and let us see Jesus and let us be conformed to his image by the Spirit of God in his name. Amen.
Um, <clears throat> so I, I was reading a little bit here. Since Haran was already dead, the lineage of Shem, which came from Abel, or as I denoted here, Abel the beloved. You remember Mordecai the carnal? <laughs> Abel the beloved would have to continue either through Nahor uh, Abraham's other brother or was still or the one that was still back in Babylon well Nahor was still back in Babylon or Abram because Haran was dead so <clears throat> all right I don't want to jump ahead too much but you're here you're in a situation they understood back then. They understood that the firstborn was important. See, it was built into their psyche. We don't think about that too much, you know? I mean, we don't have it in the same way that they had it, but they, were, they had it intrinsically in them. And so they're looking at the situation, and uh, Terah now has passed away, and Abram is the firstborn, but he's wondering, you know, the big worry with him is who's going to be my firstborn since Sarah is barren? And it's a big deal. I mean, this, see, this is, this is where we have to leave our culture and our mind and we have to say, Lord, just like put me in this so that I can see their heart and the, 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 even the fears, if necessary, of the situation. Um, and so they're, they're looking around, trying to figure out who the firstborn is going to be. Um, then I put, however, in verse 30, it says, Now Sarah was barren. She had no child. But if the firstborn's wife was barren and ended the family line, then maybe the right of the firstborn should go to someone else who could carry the line forward. Okay? Does that sound like sound thinking? You're supposed to say yes and no. <laughs> and you win the prize. It is dangerous <laughs> because sound thinking is not what we're after. Amen. Amen. I mean, you know, if that's true, then, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> when I worked for Denton State School and I worked with, and this is the term we used back then, so I'm sorry if it sounds polit politically wrong. But it was MHMR, mental health, mental retardation, and, and they were retarded kids. And, and I was a, a teacher in a classroom that had, um, I forget the number, but it was a, between 25 and 30 kids, I think. Um, and, um, you know, my whole life, we, we had been involved in ministry. My wife and I had been missionaries. Um, came back to the United States, the, the ministry that I was working with burned down and I had to get a job. And I'm sitting there going, how can I even share Jesus with these kids? They don't understand. And the Lord said to me, you're not talking to their mind. You're talking to their spirit. And I went, okay, <laughs> yeah. And got to lead a bunch of them to the Lord. And it was wonderful. And I mean, you, you could see the light, that glorious, you know, change when, when Jesus comes in. And uh, so then and there, and I was, you know, pretty young. You know, I used to be around when Moses played in the dirt, so that's how old I am. Anyway, um, then and there, I, I really understood, and that's not an easy thing for someone who hadn't visited that kind of a situation, not that exact, but I mean something like that. I understood from then on it was not about our minds. And that there could be a danger if you go by your mind and your, you know, your understanding of things. Uh, you could actually be led astray by your own mind okay so you know 
basically I'm saying I'm treating you all like retarded people. I'm sorry, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> All right, y'all are just a little bit too happy over that. Calm down. <laughs> so, so the, that's the dilemma that Abraham, Abram is in in this situation because it looks like his, his line through him, Shem, all the, going back before him to, to Abel, the beloved, the, the whole thing flowing down was going to end right there. Wow. So he's, he's going he's gonna to have to figure it out, right? That's what we say. He's going to have to figure it out. So he starts figuring. And the whole, almost, almost up to the end of the story of Abraham and where he becomes Abraham and even is him figuring and figuring and figuring. And the good news is, is that God kept intervening because God wants his son. We say, well, God intervened. Thank you for, for loving me and intervening. He's going, look, I want Jesus out of you. I put my son in you and I'd like to get him back. You know what I mean? And we're making it all about us all the time. Let's just, if we'll join with the father and the son, I mean, what did, uh, what did Paul say? Uh, I write these things, was that Paul? I write these things, John, I write these things unto you that you might have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. Amen. Do you see his identification? He is not deceived. He is not going, well, I just want fellowship with you. He said, but don't misunderstand me. Our fellowship is going to be with the Father and with his Son. That's where it's all going to culminate and rise and bring forth something eternal. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, uh, so of the sons of Terah, that leaves only one person left, uh, Nahor. But we notice that Terah's whole family came out of Babylon to follow God, except Nahor. Right? And it, like I said, it's assumed that Nahor probably wanted nothing to do with this departure. It sounded ill-fated, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> um, and then I wrote this, but there's another option, at least in the mind of Terah and Abram, and that is Lot. Mm. That's Lot. Um, you know, Haran died, but God gave him a lot. Never mind, it just came to me. It's not. I didn't say it was funny. I just. <laughs> the line of the firstborn through Abel by means of Shem could come through Lot, not through Abram. Therefore, since this is the thinking of Abram, Therefore, since the distances were long and also because Nahor did not come with them, then it looks like Lot will get the double portion as the firstborn. Though Haran was the third son, while Abram was the firstborn, yet Abram's wife was barren. To me, it always felt like Terah, the father, always favored Haran in his heart anyway. Now, that's me. But he named the place where they stayed Haran. Haran had Lot, even though he died. So it looks like to, to the patriarch Terah, the father of Abram, it looks to him like Haran, my beloved son. Is it possible that a, a father could miss this process? Guess what? Isaac did. Some of you know, but we're jumping way ahead right now. But it is absolutely possible that we get attached in our, in our social and personal and all of these things, and we make that the, the center of the thing instead of Christ and saying, Lord, I don't, 
you know, the best thing we can say is, I don't know, but you know, and I'm not going to stand on my ignorance that I don't know. I want to know. Open my eyes. Open my heart. Amen? You know, that's, the, that's what we have to do. We have to constantly do that, too. You, you know, we go, okay, well, when I'm in a religious environment, I feel it and I want to da da da, da. We've got to break that concept of I have to have a religious environment before it's going to be real. Uh, and before I'm going to really, you know, have the cry and all this kind of stuff. You can drive down the street in your car and God can zap you. I'm not talking about a car wreck either. <laughs> Although, like you said, you had to pull over. I've had to do that many a time where the Lord would start dealing with me. And uh, many a time where I just started bawling and had to pull over and let him finish his dealing. Well... But that's not the only place. You know, you, while you're on your job or while you're in school or whatever, you, you can find that the Lord is on your heart. And I believe that if you put the Lord first, the Lord will help you with school or whatever else. But if it's just about you, I mean, if, if it's just on you, <laughs> well, you know. But we, when we get through with our life, we want it all as much as possible based on the Lord. Um, gosh, maybe I can do this. I may have to read this, but I've got to make this point without break. So I may have to just read this. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> so stick with me, because this is, this is going to be important. <clears throat> I wrote, I would like for you to notice a pattern. We know that the Bible originally had no chapters or verses, right? Okay. They were added to break up the flow so that we could see the, the parts better. And I, I thank them even today for the parts because it has slowed it down in the Bible where I can take one verse and really get it and then move on. So I'm thankful for it, but it wasn't originally there. These were letters and things like that. Um, so if that's true, then I'd like to read to you a section of scripture without any breaks, but in order as they were originally written, okay? So this is, so y'all look up at me and just listen, okay? All right? <clears throat> and Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his son's son, and Sarah his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan, and they came unto Haran, and they dwelt there, and the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. What, what just happened? Yeah. What just happened? I mean, the first verse I started with, and Terah took Abram, his son, but it didn't say God spoke. God didn't speak to Abram until he was in Haran. You want me to read it again? Yes. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, Terah took, Terah took. And Lot, the son of Aran, his son's sons, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, and his son Abram's wife, and they went forth with them from, there they go, Earl Chaldees, to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord, now the Lord, now in Haran, now the Lord, uh, where did I go? Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. So I'll read this part. What just happened? I, I ran the last few verses of chapter 11 into the first verse of chapter 12. Um, I would like to show you something within these passages. To do so will, will require that we stick strictly to the account in Genesis, which, by the way, is the original that everyone after Abraham went by, you know, or at least Moses when he wrote it. <clears throat> um, 
uh, in Genesis and not let your minds wander to other places. In other words, what is Genesis telling us? Remember, it is from here that all other places in the Bible will get its account concerning these events. All right, so did Abram leave Babylon or Haran? <clears throat> here is how I see it. First, at this point in the narrative, chapter 11, God has spoken to no one in this family. Because when it says God spoke to Abram, that's chapter 12. So in chapter 11, he, God has spoken to no one in the family. <clears throat> we are merely told that Terah took his family from the Ur of Chaldees and was headed to the land of Canaan. There's no mention of God telling him to do this. The first account is recorded in Genesis 12.1 and is not spoken to Terah but to Abram. If necessary, check uh, Genesis 11 to see if the Lord has spoken to either Terah, Abram, or any other family member prior to Genesis 12.1, because he didn't. <clears throat> Second, in Genesis 11.31 through 32, it is clear that Terah took Abram with the others, along with the others. It appears that Abram was a passive participant who came along with his father. And even though Terah's goal was Canaan, he stopped and stayed at Haran, which was not part of the promised land. He was leaving something, but did not seem determined with going into. Okay. Which we can do, can we not? We can, we, you know, <clears throat> I'll just stop with this right this second and just say this, that, that um, you know, <clears throat> I mean, I've said this before, I don't know if you really let this get in you, but don't ever leave anywhere, go to the Lord. Go to, if you're, you know, there's always problems anywhere you are, anywhere you go. There can be problems at school, there can be problems on your job, da 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 da, -da. but there is a way that instead of leaving that mess, you go unto the Lord. I don't know what that means, but it's a heart thing. I mean, practically. I, I can't tell you each and every case for you, but I can tell you <clears throat> that your heart can't be upset and all involved in the earth and what's wrong. You, if you're going to go, then go to the Lord. All right. <clears throat> this is similar to the journey of the prodigal son who merely wanted to leave but missed the true journey of making the journey into the father's heart concerning the son. And you remember the prodigal. He left home and he went out and he spent all and used it for all wrong reasons. But then he says, what am I doing? I'm going to return to my father. And it didn't say his father's house. It said, I'm going to return to my father. And he came back and this whole interchange happened between the prodigal and the father. And you know the story, so I won't spell it out and we'll hear it again and again, I'm sure, through this. <clears throat> um, so so I said, this is similar to the journey of the prodigal son who merely wanted to leave but missed the true journey of making the journey into the father's heart concerning his son, which is Christ. <clears throat> so it seems feasible based upon the scripture and the fact that Terah was the head of the family that he initiated the journey out of Babylon. Again, he took them to Haran and seemed satisfied to settle there. And since he was content to do so, then the rest of the family also made it their home and the end point of the journey. Okay, so this is saying that everybody is under Terah the father, not the Lord. Okay, and they're all moving based on that, and they stop based on that. <clears throat> um, also, thirdly, in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we have the first mention of God speaking to anyone in this family. He spoke to Abram. What did God's first words to him say? He said that Abram was to leave his father's country, not Babylon. Because really, Babylon wasn't his father's country anymore. He, they left that. But this was his father's country. This was the, the place that was holding everything back, not Babylon. Um, 
Uh, well, he had already left Ur of Chaldees long before this encounter with God, but now, according to the last few verses of Genesis 11, his father's country was now Haran, just outside of the Promised Land, stopping short. It doesn't matter if you're in Babylon or Haran, you're not where God wants you. That's important. That's important. You know, and God wasn't satisfied with where Abram was because he spoke to him and said, leave your father's country. But now, according to the last few verses of Genesis 11, his father's country was now Haran, just outside of the promised land. My fourth point is that God also told him to leave his kindred. Well, unless he's just talking about Nahor, everybody else came with him. We know that when Abram obeyed God and left Haran for the promised land, that there were family members that stayed back in the place of Terah's death, Haran, right? Because that's where Rebekah came from. That's, there's a, the whole thing goes even to Jacob who went down there. Okay, so this is his kindred. This is where the kindred of Terah and Abram are. <clears throat> uh, how do we know that? Uh, we know that from Genesis 24 in the story of Abram's, Abraham sending Eliezer to bring back a bride for his son, Isaac, from Haran and from his kindred. It is important to realize that God's message to Abram was to leave his kindred located in Haran and not Babylon, and later to go to his kindred to get a wife for his son, not in Babylon, but in Haran. So in Genesis 12, 1, when God tells Abram to leave his kindred, is he talking about those in the Ur of Chaldees or in Haran? Again, I'm just stating my case. Everything about it points to the, the land and the kindred and, and even the way that it's worded when he says, now, let's see, <clears throat> probably don't have it written perfectly here. Let's see. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. So he is, he is he's already left Babylon, and he's saying, I still want something that I haven't gained yet. All right. <clears throat> so you have to also look at it spiritually, and spiritually is the reality that God, God wanted this. God wanted Abram to come in and the whole story to be written for his firstborn. Am I right or wrong? I mean, those that know the story, that's what he wanted. And that's where God's shoving towards that end. And that's probably why he didn't speak to Terah, because he wasn't going to follow through. But Abram eventually would figure out who the firstborn was, Jesus. That's what we have to do. We have to be like Abraham and figure it out and when we do, it'll be all about him, Jesus, and not us. God. All right, let me make sure I've got everything here. Um, it is important to realize that God's message to Abram was to leave his kindred located in Haran and not Babylon, and later to go to his kindred to get a wife for his son, not in Babylon, but in Haran. So in Genesis 12, 1, when God tells Abram to leave his kindred, he is talking about those in the Ur of Chaldees, or is he talking about those in the Ur of Chaldees or in Haran? When we put all these factors together, we must conclude based solely on the Genesis account that the place and people God is telling Abram to leave was not Babylon, Ur of the Chaldees, but was Haran. 
Genesis 12, 1 through 5. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. Okay, so let me add this now. You can say, Now the Lord had said, so he spoke that in, um, in Babylon. Had means back. And I'm just... I'm presenting my view of what I'm seeing here, but he said, get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. But Terah took them out. And there is no mention up until the, the doorstep of the promised land that God speaks. And... Um, and thy kindred and thy father's house. Back then, the house wasn't the building you lived in. It was the family. <clears throat> so I'm, so, you know, from my understanding, almost everybody in the whole world sees this differently. <laughs> but I, this is, I'm just telling you, this is what the way I'm seeing it. Now, I'm also telling you, don't believe anything I've just said. <laughs> Go to the Holy Spirit, look in the Word, look closely in these scriptures, and see if there isn't really the seed of the movement of God toward his firstborn more than, um, more than Abraham left the Ur of Chaldees, but rather he's right on the brink, and God is saying, I'm sick and tired of this you've been here too long <clears throat> we need to move into this is the place where it's all going to happen and you're standing right outside Hallelujah. and you feel that urgency because he goes on <clears throat> uh, now the lord said to abram get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that i will show thee and i will make of thee a great nation there it is this is firstborn stuff. <laughs> this is all motivated by it. And everything that's going on around it isn't a Bible story that we can figure out and just go, well, actually, God did speak to him there. I don't, I don't care what proofs you have. If it cannot point back to the next phrase out of here, and I will make thee a great nation, um, then it's just facts that have no spiritual meaning at all. And I don't want facts with no spiritual meaning. I want to know if God's heart is ever faithful toward his son and ever moving in his best ability, ever moving us forward together to move into the life and nature of Christ so that he gets what he wants. And what he wanted wasn't just some random guy named Abraham to dwell in a piece of dirt. All right. Do have a few other things to say about this, but I, I think I think we've had a good beginning here. <clears throat> I want to say that if what I'm saying is true, and if it is, now I'm not saying it is, and I'm not saying for you to believe it. I'm saying for you to you to find out from the Lord. But if what I'm saying is true, <clears throat> then it means it is possible for many people, even scholars, to miss exactly what the word is saying and proves the point that we just need to stay in tune with the Lord 
and don't assume and we can somebody can teach us a certain way and then we always believe it that way and we never really just look at the scripture and go wait a minute because we're off we believe in this and we think that's true we think that you know Mordecai the carnal is the most spiritual person in the story and on and on and on I mean, we can, you know, we're going we're gonna to face some more of these by the way as we go we're going to face some more but my heart is I say I don't want to be right but I want the Lord and I and I don't want to have because I don't I don't want to have pride if this is a true and it's true and everyone else has just seen it some other way I want it to break my heart and your heart and say maybe we don't know as much as we think we do would that be okay and let that not tear us down or 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 beat us down but say then I want to hear from you Lord I want you and I want you to impart the word to me so father we're we're sorry if we've just read into the scriptures and never never even considered to just have you tell us what it says we just follow along father I don't want people following along me I want them to know you and I ask you in your son's name and for his glory that you will open our hearts more and more and that these times together won't just be classes or or Bible school or another Bible study they will draw Christ out of us they'll let the firstborn be where he where you want him to be and not us holding him back in Haran or the Ur of Chaldees it doesn't matter the point is you're going to bring forth a seed that's going to be many it's going to be one seed Christ but it'll be as it says in Galatians 3 16 father he saith unto Abram thy seed which is many but he said saith thy seed which is one which seed is Christ so father thank you shake us shake our supposed depth and understanding of the scriptures and cause us not to rest upon the crutch of knowing scripture the Pharisees knew scripture and quoted them to Jesus all the time and he was the living word father we we want we want to study the scriptures but in them we want to see the living word your son draw us draw us Thank you, Father. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, some of you may want to just stay and pray a little bit. I see. Uh, and others of you, if you, you can feel free, we're dismissed. Um, uh, did you have something to share? No? Okay. Um, and then others may want to just sit in the presence of the Lord. Just feel free to. Obey the Lord now.